Hi, welcome to this Alchemist Chemistry Edible video looking at Born Harbour Cycles. This is my final video in a series of videos looking at Born Harbour Cycles, and in this particular one we're going to look at aluminium oxide, the beast. By far the biggest Born Harbour Cycle we've covered so far. I'm going to take you through how to construct the Born Harbour Cycle itself, how it works, and then to find an unknown enthalpy change using Hess law. Just before we crack on, if you're looking for some of those older videos looking at other Born Harbour Cycles, please check out the card appearing now for an earlier video to give you some background. So our first step is to build this thermochemical cycle. And how we're gonna do that is we're gonna place equations on each of these lines to represent the enthalpy changes taking place. The first arrow going down representing an exothermic process is the enthalpy change of formation. That is defined as being the enthalpy change for the formation of one mole of a compound from its elements in their standard states under standard conditions. So here are those elements in their standard states. Two moles of aluminium solid, Aluminium is a solid because it's a metal, and one and a half moles of oxygen molecules, which are in the gaseous state. Why do I need one and a half moles of oxygen molecules? Well, I'm trying to produce the formula Al2O3. That's got two moles of aluminium ions in the formula, hence I need two moles of aluminium atoms to form those aluminium ions in the formula. And I need three moles of oxygen atoms, which are coming from the one and a half moles of oxygen molecules, because it's O2, so 1.5 times 2 is 3, that's 3 moles of oxygen atoms being provided by those 1.5 moles of oxygen molecules, giving me the formula Al2O3. The next arrow is going up, showing it's an endothermic process, i.e. it's taking in the thermal energy to undertake this enthalpy change. This is the enthalpy change of atomization of aluminium. The definition of enthalpy change of atomization is the enthalpy change for the formation of one mole of gaseous atoms from its element in its standard state. So we're converting what is currently solid aluminium into gaseous aluminium. And that will take energy because we're converting it from a solid state to a gaseous state where the particles are moving much more freely. We've got to overcome attraction to do that. So we've got to put some heat energy in. And just so that I haven't done anything to the oxygen yet, that's coming up next. Our next enthalpy change, which is also endothermic in nature, is the enthalpy change of atomization of oxygen i.e. converting our oxygen molecules from gaseous molecules into moles of gaseous oxygen atoms. So we're releasing three moles of oxygen atoms in the gaseous state via this process, putting in energy effectively to break the covalent bonds between oxygen atoms in their molecules to release atoms in the gaseous state of oxygen. And now we come to the ionization phases. Now it's worth remembering that ionization energy is a successive process. We can't just jump straight from Al to Al3+, due to the quantized nature of electron energy levels. Instead, we're sequentially gonna go from Al to Al+, then to Al2+, and then to Al3+. So this endothermic arrow represents the first ionization energy for aluminium, as defined as being the enthalpy change for the removal of one mole of electrons from one mole of gaseous atoms to form one mole of monopositive ions. And of course it is going to be endothermic because you have to supply energy to overcome the attractions of the electrons to the protons in the nucleus and that's going to require energy to pull them away. So in effect we've turned two moles of aluminium atoms into two moles of aluminium plus one ions. Logically the next step is the second ionization energy for aluminium, turn those one plus ions into two plus ions. And of course, the third ionization energy for aluminium turned those aluminium two plus ions into aluminium three plus ions. We then turn our attention to the oxygen atoms. We need to convert those into negatively charged ions, which will then attract towards the positively charged aluminium ions to form the ionic compound Al2O3. This brings us to the first electron affinity for oxygen, which is an exothermic process, meaning that heat energy is being given out by this enthalpy change. The definition for first electron affinity is the enthalpy change for the addition of one mole of electrons to one mole of gaseous atoms to form one mole of mononegative ions. It is effectively the absolute opposite of the first ionization energy. So you can see that three moles of oxygen atoms have been converted to three moles of oxide minus one ions. And that's an exothermic process. Think about it in terms of Bendamex, breaking bonds, endothermic, making bonds, exothermic. We are making attractions between uh, incoming electrons and protons in the nucleus creating these negative ions. So that is exothermic because we are forming attractions. And finally, we come on to the second electron affinity for oxygen, turning those minus one oxide ions into minus two oxide ions. 
And weirdly, that's an endothermic process. You think about it, what we're trying to do here is put negative electrons onto already negative ions. That's going to be difficult because we're going to have to overcome the natural repulsion between two negative species. That's going to require energy to be put in, hence the process is endothermic. And actually, all second electron affinities for negative ions will be endothermic processes. You can see this leaves us with an unknown lattice enthalpy. And this enthalpy is defined as the enthalpy change for the formation of one mole of an ionic compound, or a giant ionic lattice, from its constituent ions in their gaseous state. This is where we can use Hess's law to our advantage. Hess's law states that the enthalpy change of a chemical reaction is the same independent of the route taken. So if we make this unknown enthalpy change of lattice enthalpy our route one, if we can take an alternative route that gets to the same endpoint of Al2O3, Hess's law states that the total enthalpy change of that route will be identical to the enthalpy change of route one. And just so happens we've constructed a Hess cycle, our Born Harbor cycle, which does exactly that. If we follow our cycle backwards from this starting point to the same endpoint of Al203, the total enthalpy change of that entire route will be equal to the enthalpy change of route one according to Hess law, and we will have solved our unknown enthalpy change, our lattice enthalpy. How fantastic is that? Right, I've now brought in the various values for the enthalpy changes taking place. Uh, I want to explain where these multiplications, these times two and these times three values are coming from. I've got times two for the atomization of aluminium and for the first, second and third ionization energies for aluminium because we're using two moles of aluminium in our cycle. We've got two Al here, so I must use two times the enthalpy change of atomization because that only deals with one mole of aluminium atoms. Same for the first, second and third ionization energies as well. I also have times three for the oxygen because I'm making three moles of oxygen atoms at this atomization phase for oxygen. We're taking one and a half moles of O2 molecules and breaking them apart into three moles of oxygen atoms. That's three times the atomization, which only deals with one mole's worth of oxygen atoms. Same with the first and second electron affinities. That number is just for one mole of oxygen atoms, so we have to multiply it by three to scale up to three moles of oxygen atoms being involved. It's really important you include those multiplications in your calculations. If you forget to do so, you're going to be out by quite a degree in terms of your precision and your actual answer being quite inaccurate. So please ensure you have taken note of how many moles of various things are involved at various stages before you crack on to your calculations. I'm now going to take you step by step along the route we're going to take around our cycle to find our enthalpy change. If we have to go against the direction of travel of an enthalpy change arrow, it will require us to reverse the sign of that enthalpy change. I'll explain that as we go around. So the golden rule in trying to find an unknown enthalpy change arrow on a Born Harbor cycle like this is to mark the tail of the arrow you're looking for as the starting point and the head of the arrow you're looking for as the finishing point. Remembering you can't go directly from tail to head because we don't know that enthalpy change it hasn't been determined instead we're going to go around our cycle taking our alternative route to the same end point at the finishing point at the end of the head of the arrow and the sum of all those enthalpy changes together will give us the same as the enthalpy change of route one now that means sometimes we're going to go against the direction of travel of an enthalpy change arrow on our head cycle if that happens we are doing the opposite energetics of that process let me take you around the cycle and show you what i mean if we start here and work our way around, we're going to be going against this endothermic process here. We're doing the opposite energetics of the second electron affinity of oxygen multiplied by three. We're then doing the opposite energetics of the first electron affinity of oxygen times three. The opposite energetics of the third, uh, third ionization energy of um, aluminium times two. The opposite energetics of the second ionization energy of aluminium times two. The opposite energetics of the first ionization energy of aluminium times two, the opposite energetics of the atomization of oxygen times three, the opposite energetics of the atomization of aluminium times two, and then actually doing the same energetics as the enthalpy of formation of aluminium oxide. In other words, this is the formula we're going to follow to find our unknown enthalpy change summarized for you there, just following those arrows backwards. You can see lots of the time we're going against the energetics of the processes and only once are we going with the energetics of the enthalpy of formation. I'm now going to do that numerically so you can see what that calculation looks like. So I hope you're ready. Now we're going to add the numbers in and see how this goes. So 
Following our cycle back this way, we're going to go against this endothermic process here, which will be minus plus 844 four times 3, and against the direction of this exothermic process here, which will be minus minus 142 times 3, and against this endothermic process here, which will be minus plus 2740 times 2, against this one as well, minus plus 1820 times 2, against this one, minus plus 577 times 2, against this one, minus plus 248 times 3, against this one, minus plus 314 times 2. And then finally, going with the same identity as the enthalpy of formation of aluminum oxide, which is plus minus 1669. So if you write that down really carefully, and then even more carefully type that into your calculator, the sum of all those various enthalpy changes give us the enthalpy change of lattice enthalpy as minus 15,421. That's a huge lattice enthalpy. At this point, at the end of your calculation, you probably want to check you've got this right. It was a huge calculation, a lot of work went into this, and you really want to make sure that number isn't incorrect. There's a really neat trick you can use to prove that answer's right. If you go full cycle around a Bornhaber cycle back to the starting point, you're effectively taking away one route from the other, and if they both have the same enthalpy change, the answer should, should be zero. And if the answer isn't zero, you know you've made a mistake, and you can go back and check your working and see if you can figure out where you've made that computational error. But let me prove it to you by giving it a go now. I also shows you that calculator control is essential in any Bourne Harbor or Hess cycle situation. So working away from the starting point all the way around again, that will be minus plus 844 times 3, then minus minus 142 times 3, then minus plus 2740 times 2, then minus plus 1820 times 2, then minus plus 577 times 2, then minus plus 248 times 3, then minus plus 314 times 2, then plus minus 1669, just checking the working there, uh, and then finally we're going against our direction of travel back to our starting points, but in the opposite of our lattice enthalpy, that would be minus minus 15,421, and minus minus 15,421 gives us an answer of zero. Okay, just check that there. It's zero. So our cycle is working perfectly. We've solved this Born Harbor cycle correctly. Woohoo. Good job, us. Pat on back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There you have it, folks. Uh, well done for getting to the end there. Uh, that's probably the biggest Born Harbor cycle you're ever going to have to solve. And if you can solve this one, you can solve any Born Harbor cycle. The world is literally your oyster when it comes to chemical calculations. Um, if you found this video useful, please do think about giving it a like. You can even subscribe to the channel to keep updated with our latest content. I do put out videos pretty much on a weekly basis, uh, and your support is always hugely appreciated to keep me motivated and moving forwards. Um, so, Thanks as always and take care guys. Bye now.